All right. So, um, cracking codeine or codeine. Um, does everybody know what dependency injection is? Everybody's used it, whether or not you know what it is or not. So, uh, codeine is a dependency injection framework, and Kotlin is obviously a replacement for Java that uses the JVM. So this is a dependency injection framework built for Kotlin um, versus other dependency injection frameworks that were built for Java. So Kraken is one of these things, and it has nothing to do with the rest of this talk. I just really like this picture, so enjoy. It's a really good picture. I liked it. All right, so dependency injection. Dependency injection is the uh, practice of inversion of control. Everybody know what that is? Anybody? Somebody. Certainly one programmer in this room knows what inversion of control means. Felipe wants to say what it is. As soon as he finishes his pizza, everybody stare at him. <laughs> inversion of control, go. Okay, when you give someone else responsibility for what this test should do. There we go. That's pretty much the whole talk. So, <laughs> inversion control is obviously when objects take a single responsibility and they use each other to perform actions that they don't really understand how to do. So, like printing to the console, um, talking to the network, these are all things that objects might need to do, but in a very indirect manner. They just want to send a message, they don't really care how the message gets sent. Inversion and control. Okay, so what is a DI framework then? Obviously, dependency injection is handing objects to other objects. So the DI framework helps you facilitate this in, uh, in more program programmatic ways that give you flexibility for how to move objects to other objects in a way that doesn't require you to architect everything out to the nth detail since we don't usually have that much time. How do DI frameworks generally work? Does anybody know the answer to this one? Everybody here is like scene, dagger, uh, juice. Anybody know how they actually work? Kind of. It's not much confidence. Code generation? No. I mean, well, so that's the implementation. But how does a dependency framework actually work? You define a thing that gives you all the dependencies you have. Like, here's the thing that prints, here's the thing that sends data. Yes, but functionally. What's the thing that makes the whole thing work? What's the concept there? It's graphs. So kind of like a map, but oh, yep. and graphs are what allow us to define dependencies on a global and then get more and more defined the higher up we go and then get rid of those pieces as needed, right? So dependency injection framework in its totality gives us the ability to describe a really complex ecosystem of objects, but do it into small little pieces where they contextually all make sense together, right? So you have uh, the concept of modules is something a lot of dependency injection frameworks use as a way to abstract out all the little pieces of, you know, your, your managers might need to use an API, um, but neither one of them should really be defining all the pieces of those uh, individually. So the API would define all of its API dependencies while the managers would define all of its direct manager dependencies, and then you use interfaces as a way to create the contracts. So dependency injection frameworks literally just facilitate that. All right, so what problems do the dependency injection framework solve? Everybody knows the answer to this, right? We just covered it. Felipe? You can just say it. Inversion of control. Inversion of control. Yes, <laughs> on a grand scale. All right, so it aids and uh, support a single responsibility principle, which is what inversion of control is talking about, right? Every object should do one thing, should do that one thing really well, and the objects should work together to solve bigger problems, right? Um, so that's, that's literally the problem that they're solving. And the broader problem that it's solving is to prevent you from architecting an app down to every single little piece. Since if you wanted to um, not use a dependency injection framework, you have to figure out how to move all of your objects between everything else, how to handle the situations where you need a singleton. Um, how to handle the situations where you need factory patterns. It's not that you need a dependency injection framework to solve these problems. It's just that nobody wants to type all that up because you, you just don't need to. And you're, you're getting rid of all those error-prone areas. All right, so what can be injected? Dependency injection uh, can be used for things like your managers. These are the things where 
Uh, managers generally be the things that perform some kind of broader action, like I need to post this message or I need to go grab something out of the database. Now, they're not the database themselves. They just understand complex operations with other objects. Uh, presenters. Presenters are something that you might be using to control your views. So you have an activity that implements a view. The presenter knows how to talk to that view, and the presenter doesn't care that it's an activity. That would be something that you might want to inject. Um, other general abstractions, since these are both basically that. So generally, anything you would pass to a constructor, because that's the inversion of control, right? So what are some other DI frameworks? Other than Dagger, does anybody know of any? Any of you used any other dependency injection framework? Get out. <laughs> Juice. Juice. Perfect. Any other ones? Spring. Everybody's heard of Spring, right? Did anybody know that's what Spring is? Yeah. Awesome. There you go. Um, there's also things like Pico Container. Um, there's another Kotlin dependency injection framework called Coin. Um, and then, of course, everybody's favorite, Dagger and Dagger 2. Um, those are all different options. Obviously, some of them are made for Android. Um, so there's a bunch. So Coden is just one option. It might not be the best one for you. But if you're using Kotlin, I think it is. So but everybody's read 800 Dagger articles, right? We've all been on Medium. Dagger is the best thing ever, so I should just leave because this is all you should use, um, except it's not. So bindings. Has anybody read through the Dagger docs? It would have taken you about 30 seconds to do it. Nobody? Been to the, the dagger.io or whatever the web page is? Their documentation sucks, and defining the bindings can be really confusing because of that. Uh, they don't really give you much to go on of how you should define like a broader Android um, architecture while using their framework. Um, there are sample projects and things like that you can use to try to figure out what you could possibly do. Um, however, when it comes down to it, the bindings are just confusing, and that's because you use annotations to define the bindings, which then gets to the code generation. Um, so now there's just a lot of things that happen that are outside of your control or knowledge. Um, and I mean, even with the code generation, does anybody know where the code generation goes? Like when you use a library that actually does code generation, where, where's that code? It's, in, it's hidden inside your build folder. It, there's, a, there's a build. It's uh, like build, um, what well, doesn't matter. The point is that it's hidden and it's not nice code. It's code that you would not write yourself. So that all plays into that. All right, so next one. Producers and modules can be confusing. Has anybody seen a Dagger app which has like uh, just one or two modules? Everything fits inside those one or two modules. Everything in these higher applications just defined all together in a big mess, right? One of the selling points of Dagger was that dependency injection is supposed to increase testability. However, you end up using a lot of these inject annotations inside of your classes, and then you have these god modules that just kind of shove stuff in there, and it ends up not really making testing all that much easier, um, in my opinion. But <clears throat> it's kind of like an anti-pattern almost. And that's where we get to the god modules. Most projects using Dagger that I've seen have one module, and that's the Dagger, like, base module. Everything's in there, and it's probably, like, two or 300 lines of just defining dependencies. What's the point? <laughs> you know, you might as well just make everything like a singleton or a factory at that point, because it's all just in one single place anyways. You've lost a lot of the benefits of using a dependency injection framework. And if you are uh, coming from something like Spring, you know, you'd just be like, wow, this is terrible. This doesn't make any sense. It's not really Dagger's fault. It's really kind of the API. Um, if anybody's used Dagger, you've definitely hit this. When you make a mistake, Dagger does not help you. It's just like, hey, you broke the project. Good luck. You'll figure it out, buddy. It's like, I can't do that. Um, sometimes it'll give you a slightly helpful error about it, like, you know, being a repeated binding. Um, but usually you get these nasty, you know, 400 line stack traces of nonsense. And again, it's not your code that broke. It's the compiled code trying to be compiled. You know, it broke or generated code uh, that broke. So it's the engine that generates the code broke. And then you're like, I don't care about any of that stuff. What's the real reason? It doesn't really tell you. Um, and then, of course, I covered the documentation. It's very, very sparse. Um, doesn't go over many scenarios. And even their helper app of showing you how to build a coffee maker in, in Java is just not 
not very realistic for what you would use it for. Um, even though it does tell you everything you need to know, it's just kind of hard to learn from as a, uh, you know, as an abstract example. All right. <clears throat> and then of course, uh, Dagger doesn't give you many options. Like you've got the basically providers, factories, um, and singletons. It also provides scoping to a limited extent, but um, they're not that flexible and there's just not many options compared to what other DI frameworks give you. So what is Coden? Um, Coden, uh, by its own definition, is a very simple and yet very useful dependency retrieval container. It is very easy to use and configure. Sounds pretty nice. Um, is code and stable? Obviously, before you use any library, you should be concerned that it wasn't some fly-by-night operation and they didn't just like give up on it. Um, this is lifted from the author of Coden. He gave a talk, and this was his history of the progression of Coden. Um, so we can see that it started in 2015. That's about when Kotlin started becoming mainstream and started becoming like towards the stable language that it is now. Um, and now at version 4, it's finally where he perceived the dependency injection framework to be. So the nice thing is that by starting to use it now, it's unlikely to significantly change going forward. Um, there may still be small breaking changes, but compared to this transition, we're past the hard parts where we're there. So now's a good time to jump in on it. All right, does it do cool Kotlin things? Uh, Kotlin's obviously awesome. Everybody wants to use it, so it's important to use the cool little things, um, and it does. Uses the infix functions. Um, does it, everybody know what those are? Infix is the really cool, like, where you have your object and then some random keyword and then another object, but like you didn't call a function or anything, right? But you did. That's the infix function. So you can do something like one multiplied by two. That's actually correct program language. Um, and using infix functions, you can actually define those features. Coden makes extensive use of those. Reified is a really cool way to uh, help with dealing with generics. If you haven't seen that before, we'll get into that later. Um, and then, of course, a simple DSL. So it's kind of like Gradle, except that you can understand it. All right, so the basics of binding. Um, the whole idea with any dependency management framework is to have a thing that you need and define how to get that thing. So anybody that needs, like, I need a manager, this is how you get a manager, right? Like that's, it's that instance over there. So this is the implementation of the manager. This is the definition of how to get it. And this is how it's bound inside of Coden. So a singleton um, means that you're only going to get one of it. So per Coden instance, there will only ever be one manager. And anything that needs a manager bound like this will get exactly that. Pretty simple, right? Any questions on this? It's only going to get harder from here. Now, there is a little bit of other code that would go above and below this. I'm just trying to get through the simple examples. Um, so another really common one is provider, which means that every single time I need a manager, just give me a new instance of a manager. All right? Like, I don't care how the manager is instantiated. I just need a new manager. Pretty simple, right? So very similar. The only thing we changed was the keyword provider for singleton, or singleton for provider. Next really common one um, is that you might have implementations that you want to define by tags. So this is showing that you can just put in your tag, and then when it comes time to call for that implementation, you just have to know what tag, and then you get that specific one. So if we had you know, 15 different, different implementations of manager, all we need to know is the tag. <clears throat> and then next is factory pattern. Factory pattern is really useful for when, at the time that you need the object, you need to perform some level of configuration of the object. So in this case, we want the manager with a specific ID. So we just pass the ID in when we go to bind it later. And uh, again, this is only the definition side. I'm going to show you guys how to actually call this later. But pretty simple, real easy to understand. Um, the only reason it's on two lines is because it ran out of screen space. <clears throat> All right, so let's see. This is so hard to read. All right, <clears throat> so the other binding types. Um, those are the ones that you're most likely going to use. But these are other ones that are available if you need them. Um, constants are pretty common, but you pretty much only use them like 
while you're setting up the project for setting things like your API URL, um, you know, uh, something like in this example, max thread, something you're pretty much never going to change. So you don't really end up using very much. Scoped is really helpful if you can imagine having a, like a dependency that you only want to live as long as like an activity for se, or maybe as long as a fragment. Um, you can use scopes to try to bind the, the dependency to the life cycle of something, which is pretty helpful. Um, instance binding, multiton, and eager. Uh, multiton is a singleton kind of binding um, where you pass in, like a factory, some kind of identifier. And it will make sure that any other thing that uses that identifier will get back that same instance. So pretty handy, um, but again, not something that you typically use too much. All right. So modules. Earlier, I was talking about modules or how dependency infraction, dependency injection frameworks let you define your dependencies. So in Coden, you can define modules anywhere you want. You can define as many as you want, and the Coden object provides facilities for you to define which module should be brought in at which times. So in this case, we've defined in the module. Everybody remembers the provider you know, definition here. And this is a valid DI object now. We can now use this. This is an actionable thing. <clears throat> um, how did this get? All right, there we go. So the actual base code in um, allows for you to extend things as well. So. You can take, you can either import modules or you can extend them. They have different properties that you'd have to get into. But the idea is that you get the flexibility. You get the, um, uh, sorry, why don't I have any notes? I should have notes. All right. You get the ability to extend them, which is really helpful for, uh, for building up the dependency. Is that the note? No, it's not. All right, moving on. <clears throat> This one. OK. So when it comes time to actually retrieve uh, from Coden, Coden is the actual compiled dependency injection graph. And you can get your instances from it. So here we have the dice factory. Um, and the definition of what we want is a function that returns dice. Um, this is a cool Kotlin thing, because Kotlin can pass around functions. So we're saying we don't even really care if it's a class or what it is that we get back here. But we want the factory that just returns dice. It's pretty simple, right? Um, data source, we're just saying that we want the thing that's bound to the data source interface or class, whatever this is, and then so on. Um, <coughs> any questions here? So you're saying that I'm asking for the instance of the thing that I define mm -hmm. as like the binder of data source or the binder of the thing that Yep. Yep. And uh, you need to know a little bit about how it was uh, bound because you could have multiple binding types, like if it was factory or an instance or provider. And so it lets you specify exactly which one you're looking for, um, which can be really useful if you have multiple of the same kind of binding. And again, I'm going to show you this in like actual code, so it'll be a little bit more clear. <clears throat> All right, so dependency retrieval. Um, the actual functional implementation of Coden is that you need to build out the way of how Coden is going to be accessed, that Coden object, right? Like, it doesn't just come out of nowhere. Like, there has to be a way that you get it, right? So Coden provides a few different ways to actually access the Coden object. Coden injected is one of those. Coden injected makes you implement this injector. All you have to do is find this, but you can do some customization here. Um, but out of the box, this is the simple, let's just get started. And so this class manager. All we'd have to do is instantiate it, and then all of a sudden, now we can start getting our bindings. And just by using the by, this is a lazy instantiation. So either immediately or sometime later, this will actually get bound for us. Everybody following that? Does everybody know what lazy is in Kotlin? Cool. All right, so <clears throat> if you're doing Android, this would be a really common approach that you would have in the root of your application. You have your application um, class called my app, it extends application. You make it code and aware. And then all you have to do is define your root code and object. So this is like the, the single source of truth. Everything else that you're going to define later is going to get built on top. Here we've brought in our manager, our manager module. Um, so this is like the foundation of getting our application started. Um, and then at the activity, 
um, we have these really nice helper, helper classes. Now this actually just implements code and injected for us, but it takes care of all of the little pieces that we'd have to put together otherwise. So what we get is all you have to do is provide this if you even want to. You could just use that root application object. Um, but in this case, we're saying that this activity actually needs this presenter module. And this presenter defines everything that we need later. Um, obviously, I'm not showing you what that module looks like. But this is an idea of what it would look like in your code. And all the dependencies you need would all get injected purely by that by instance, which is really handy. So obviously, those are a lot of very terse samples. So I tried to write up a small, uh, small demonstration of this. Yeah, actually, it was built for Java. Uh, well, it was built for just pure Kotlin. Um, then they added on Android. But uh, they do have helper functionality, which I found out today um, out of a requirement that uh, you can use it with Java. Yeah. You know, can. Can. It, it has uh, helper methods to help you deal with that. Just a second. Uh, nope. Let's try that one. There we go. <coughs> All right. <clears throat> so what I've done here is I've wrote some unit tests just to quickly show you how uh, how coding can be used in real code. Um, this configurable code in object just emulates that whole code in aware um, demonstration that I was showing you in the application code. Um, this just gives us one to use, and so we can configure it, then use it that simple. So here we can see that we create a code in object. We add a configuration, which we're binding um, the string one to the bind string. Here we're going to grab the instance that we created. So this injected string should be one. And then we're going to assert that 1 equals the injected string. So we just come over here, run the test, and we see that it passed. So we know that it worked, right? So coming to 2, um, we can see tagging being used. So in this case, we have a string that's tagged with the name tag. It returns the string 2. We uh, grab the injection of the tagged string. And then again, we just evaluate that it equals. So we run that. Obviously, it's going to pass. Any questions here? Does this make sense to everybody, like what we're doing? It's like almost like a map, just weird, weird access to it. All right. And before, I was mentioning that um, Codin actually helps you when, uh, when things go bad. When you make a mistake, it does a lot to help you figure out how you made a mistake. So here we have a string with um, a tag and another string. But we can see here that we used the wrong tag, right? There, there is nothing that's bound with the tag incorrect tag. So when we run this, this is going to fail, right? Because there's nothing to get. It doesn't know what to do in this situation. So what happens is that you get this really nice stack trace. And let me see if I make this a little bit bigger. All right, so it's going to tell us no provider found for bind string incorrect tag. So this is saying we were looking for incorrect tag. We couldn't find it. It doesn't know what to do. But right here, it tells us what we actually registered. So this is everything that's in the code and object that's registered. And we can see right there that, yeah, it's correct. There's nothing called incorrect tag in there. That's pretty awesome, right? Does everybody understand that? That's like almost pure English. Like, no crazy stack traces, just here's the problem. And even better, right here, we can go to the function call site. This is where we screwed up. So if we were to just change this real quick to tag, we run the test again. And... Uh, Oh, yeah. You you correct the test, so it's actually right. So, uh, so that's pretty fun. <clears throat> All right. So getting a little bit more complicated. So that's really nice when the thing that you want to provide doesn't take any dependencies. But what about the situations when you need to find a dependency, and that dependency depends on other dependencies, right? Like that's going to be a really common situation for you. So that's transitive dependencies. So here we can see that we have this database. Um, for whatever reason, we need our database to be a singleton. 
but those managers that I was talking about that would provide the operations on the database, we don't really need a singleton of that because it doesn't really store anything. It doesn't do anything important. It can stay around as long as it needs to and then go away uh, with garbage collection, right? But it does need to operate on the database. So what Coden lets you do is the same way that you access instances outside of the Coden object, that's how you access them inside. So you just say, I need an instance of what this takes, which we can see right here. The manager requires a database implementation. And uh, that's how you build a manager, right? So when we ask for the instance here, we get a manager and we get the database already injected into the manager for us. Nice, right? And everybody understands that. You guys really need to go look at the Dagger documentation so you can be like, how the hell does this work compared to this? Like, this is awesome. And we can, of course, run the test. We can see that in the manager that we got back, the database is not null. We know it all worked. Cool. Yeah? <clears throat> all right, so contracts. That last example was, uh, was all right, but it's a little contrived because what you would typically do um, is you would have interfaces. Interfaces are your contracts in programming languages, right? They define the operations generically of what you're going to need to do, and it's up to the implementations to actually perform those operations. But as a contract, you don't care how they perform those. So in this case, we have two managers. We have a user manager and we have a document manager. Um, on, on this example, they obviously don't do anything important, but they do have a name. So for each name, we should know if we got the right one back. So here in Coden, we're going to define both of them as managers. So that's key. But they're going to return implementations of each, right? And in this case, <clears throat> this is another fail example where we can see that we define two managers. We're asking for a manager back, but Coden doesn't have the ability to tell us, um, or sorry, in this case, because we defined the manager twice, this is an incorrect binding, right? There's no way to distinguish these two. There's no way to access the correct one. So this is going to fail later on. So instead of letting it fail later on, Coden just tells us immediately, you can't do that, right? <clears throat> so here's the more correct. Uh, implementation where we're using tags. So exact same implementation as before, but we're going to use the tags to get the right document or the right manager. So we run this. User manager returns user manager. Document manager returns document manager. Everything's cool. All right? Still no questions on this? No question. The last one. This is stretch. What if, so what if in the assert you would actually no, not in the search, sorry, in the, in the first test. You're saying you're asking for a valid manager manager? Yep. What if you were to ask for like, the user manager? Would Kava be able to interpret that? No, it's, uh, it's failing trying to bind this. So if we run this test again. So it's failing at the bind, not what it's actually trying to cause. Yeah, so you can see that we have this line here. If we go to the call site, um, it's saying that when we tried to get this, so it, it does a lazy evaluation, right? So this doesn't actually perform any operation until the first time that it's called. And that's when it tries to understand like what to get back. So it tries to go through it. It can't figure it out. And what it's saying right here at 33, it's saying this is the second time we've bound uh, to the manager interface, which is what it talks about right here. So it must not override an existing binding. Um, now, you can actually override bindings in Coden but you have to tell it that you are acknowledging that you want to override a binding. Um, I don't want to get into that because it gets a bit more complicated, but, but that is something you can do. Um, but out of the box, it doesn't want you to do that. That's not something that you should typically be striving to do. Um, so it just fails outright and it leaves it to you to fix it. And so this is a potential fix for a situation like that. All right, so modules. As I mentioned before, modules are a good way to encapsulate um, dependencies that are related to each other. So in this case, we have a user manager. It uses an API. Those are two things that would naturally go together. Um, so both of them are defined in the same place as a single module. But because it's a module, that's not an actionable code in object. Like you can't grab something from a module. It's, it's nothing. It's just a definition. It's like a map. <clears throat> so here we have an API. Um, the user manager requires the database, and it requires an API. But you notice that we didn't define a database here, right? 
So where would the database come from? Now, as we talked about before, a database is something that you probably would have singleton. Um, it's highly likely. Um, it's also highly likely that you're going to use a database all throughout your app. Um, so it's highly likely that you would want to define the database once in your application class in that base binding. Um, that's, that's something that we would probably end up doing. So here, we define the database, but we also import the module that we defined outside of it. So this module is just going to hope that a database is defined somewhere. Um, if it wasn't, Coden would obviously fail. Um, and we can see that when we get the instance of user manager, which we're doing this in a slightly different way than we've done before, um, we're going to get that user manager, um, which gets the API and the database. Now, if you notice that we're using um, generics to grab it, and that's because of the Kotlin reified types. So we could actually just do something like this. And this is effectively the exact same as the line before it. And so we run that. And the code passes because that's this is logically equivalent code. So whichever instance works better for you at the time of calling, you can use that. Um, and reified types look like this if you're interested. It's just a generic with this extra reified, which passes extra information for it. But that's a that's a different talk. All right. So, is there any questions about that? Can you go out and look at the database injection again? Yeah. So here's the database class. Um, it doesn't take anything or do anything. Um, it's just a class definition. Same thing with API. Um, we define the API. We define the user manager, which depends on. Um, we see the user manager depends on a database, and it depends on an API. Um, and then the database is defined here in the base config. Make sense? Yep. And then importing the module actually gave us what we really wanted. Sound good? Yep. Cool. So another thing, going back to the, uh, to the overriding, we can actually do things like this and do bind database. So say that we wanted to uh, replace the database. We could do that. This is going to be the exact same definition as before. Well, here it's a singleton. Let's say for whatever reason I need a provider-based um, database. Now this is going to fail because we're overriding a definition that already exists, right? Which we saw earlier, that you must not override an existing binding. But in that situation where you do want to override an existing binding, it's literally as simple as just saying that, yes, I would like to do it. I'm intentionally doing this. And of course, that failed. Why did that fail? All right. Oh, it's here. There we go. You have to opt in twice. So you have to opt in for, at the module level, the ability to override, and then at the exact bindings, which one you want to actually override. Um, again, that's just to help you not make mistakes, since if you get two different instances than what you expect, that's a very hard bug to track down. Nobody wants to go look at hex codes all day. So any other questions? No? Thank you.